At this time, we turn our attention to our readings. We begin with our first reading from Exodus chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. In front of Baal-Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him, and took six hundred chosen chariots and all other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pahahiroth in front of baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar and cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal, normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all of the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want you to picture yourself in the airport. If you're going to go somewhere, you can decide wherever you'd like to go and for whatever reason that may be. But you're in the airport, you make your way onto the airplane. You find your seat, and as you find your seat, the airplane begins taxiing to the runway. As it prepares for takeoff, you stand up and begin wildly flapping your arms like this. 
And you go and you go and you go, and the flight attendant comes to you and says, what are you doing? You look at the flight attendant and you say, well, I've got to help this plane get up in the air. The flight attendant looks back at you and says, no, you, you really don't have to do that. And so you look back at the flight attendant and you say, no, I think I know what I'm talking about. I really do have to do that. They look back at you and say, I promise, you can, you can sit down. It would be better for you and for everybody else if you just took a seat. Finally, you talk your way into just letting yourself try, and you flap your wings for a real long time until you get tired, and you can't do it anymore. And at that point, you begin to realize that it's time to stop trying, and it's time to start trusting. That is the truth of the day. Stop trying and start trusting. We're in a sermon series on the book of Exodus called Let My People Go. That is a phrase that comes up seven different times within this book, Let My People Go. Today, we are going to hear the part of the story where Moses does, excuse me, Pharaoh does exactly that. He lets the people go. And what happens next is like something that you might imagine you're only ever going to see in a movie. Something kind of like the movie we're about to see on the screen. You got us into this parking lot, pal. Now you get us out. You want out of this parking lot? Okay. Would there be anything else? Yes, do you have a Miss Piggy? Now, what do the Exodus and the Blues Brothers have to do with each other? Very, very little, except for the fact that when we watch this scene, we get a peek at what the Exodus was like, or what, it, in fact, it really was. One of the most historic chases that has ever, ever taken place. Now, you might be wondering, how is there a chase in the Exodus, or why is there a chase? Didn't the pastor just say that this is the part of the story where Pharaoh looks at, the, at Moses and says, go, get out? Yes, that is true, but they don't leave without a chase like we just saw. See, after Pharaoh has had enough, after he's gone through the the plagues, he looks at the Israelites and says, go, get out. And then he has a change of heart. He realizes that by sending the Israelites away out of Egypt, he has essentially just ruined the economy of all of Egypt. All of their free labor is now making its way out the door and and out the city and, and wherever they're going to go to next. And so Pharaoh has this change of heart where he says, we've made a huge mistake. We've got to go and we've got to find the the Israelites and we've got to chase after them and find them and capture them and to bring them back. Now in the height of this chase, God gives the Israelites a command. Now there are there are hundreds of commands that are given throughout Scripture. But the command that's given to the Israelites that we hear tonight might be the scariest command that God has given. Because while they're making their way out of Egypt, working their way towards freedom, God commands the people, he says, turn around. Go back a little bit. Set up camp by the sea. Here you have the Israelites who have been waiting and waiting for freedom. They're on their way to freedom. They can see it. And what does God say? hold up a minute. Stop. Stop where you are. Not just stop. Turn around and go back a little bit. And then I just want you to get comfortable right there for a little bit. Now, at first glance, that maybe doesn't sound so bad. But the thing about this is that it makes the, t- the Israelites an easy target for the Egyptians. With the, the, the Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptians behind them, the Israelites are primed to be surrounded and to be uh, trapped and and brought back 
to Egypt as slaves. Now, you might understand why then they would be asking, why would God give us this command? We could see freedom. We were on our way to freedom. Why would God give us this command that seems so dangerous? And as they're trying to make sense of it, the Egyptian army is only getting closer. And Pharaoh has sent his army, including 600 chariots. Now, you might think, chariots, no big deal. It's a little bit archaic, right? Who deals with chariots anymore? Right? But we're dealing with the Old Testament, and there's nothing more dangerous at this time than a chariot. What tanks were to World War II is what chariots were to this period of time. Chariots were unique because they allowed for arrows to be shot from a great distance. Not only were you able to shoot your arrow from a great distance, but you were able to shoot the arrow while continuing to advance toward your target. All the more reason for the people of Israel to ask this question. Why would God do this to us? We were so close. Why would he turn us back? Now, you've probably experienced asking these kinds of questions before as well. A time when you felt like you were on your way to something bigger, something better, only for God to stop you in your tracks and say, hold on, wait right there. I know you can see it, but it's not going to happen or it's not time yet. Maybe you thought you were going to get that big promotion. Maybe there was some school or program that you thought you were going to get into. Maybe on your way to the big tryout, you were determined you were going to make that team. Only for God to say, hold on, wait a minute, stop right there. And understandably, you might have been asking that same question that the Israelites are asking tonight. Why would God do this? And that might lead you to yet another really important question. Why can't God let me do at least a little bit of the work? Why can't God let me have some part, even just a small part, in finding my own solution? It seems like a very reasonable question or a very reasonable request. The Israelites knew that it seemed like a bad idea to stop and to set up camp while the Egyptians were close on their, on their tracks. So why couldn't they use their common sense to do something more reasonable? Did he think that they were stupid? Did he think that they didn't know what to do? Did he think that they didn't know how to do it? What was the deal? Now, we're, we're asking a lot of questions of God tonight, especially in, in this context. We're asking, you know, why does God seemingly send us into dead ends? Or why doesn't God let us have any kind of part in finding our own solution? As we get further and further into the text tonight, many of those questions become answered. Now, as the Egyptian army is approaching the Israelites in their camp, God goes to Moses and he gives Moses a command. He says, Moses, I want you to go to the sea. I want you to put your staff out over the sea. And when he does that, the waters split in a way that nobody has ever seen before and in a way that nobody has seen since. And he says, I want you to go across the sea. I want you to cross the sea on dry land. And as miraculous as this is, it's not enough to deter Pharaoh and his army. Pharaoh looks at what's happening and says, great, we'll go there too. If that's where they're going, we're going to follow after because we're faster and we're stronger, and eventually we are going to catch up. So the Israelites go in on dry land, across the sea. Both, uh, Pharaoh and his army follow quickly after making up ground. And to this point, God has been present with the Israelites. He's been leading them as a, as a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire at night. At this point in time, God changes his, his tactic up a little bit. No longer is he leading them from the front of the line. Now God is herding them from the back of the line. You've got both groups of people in the middle of the Red Sea, and you have God himself present right between them, creating this buffer so that the Egyptians can never truly catch up to Moses and the Israelites. And they go through on dry land all night. When morning comes, they're still in the midst of the sea, and God goes to Moses and he gives him an, another command. He says, just like you did before, just like you put your staff out over in front of the Israelite people over the water, I want you to go back. I don't want you to look forward. I want you to look back toward the Egyptian army, and I want you to, again, 
put your staff over the water. And when he puts his staff over the water, water does what it naturally does. It falls back into place. It crashes back to earth, crashing over Pharaoh and the army and it, the entirety of the Egyptian uh, army that has followed them into the sea, completely wiping out this army. All the while, the Israelites up ahead of them continue to be protected with walls of water on their right hand and on their left hand. The army behind them is gone, and yet the Israelites continue to cross the sea on dry land. Now let's revisit some of those questions about God that we were asking earlier. That first one was, why does God tell the Israelites to camp along the sea even though they know that the Egyptians are bearing down on them? It's because he wanted the Israelites to stop trying and start trusting. Why does God today in the present, why does he lead us into places that appear to be dead ends, places that lead us feeling vulnerable and defenseless? It's likely because he wants you to stop trying and start trusting. And why is God so adamant that we need to trust more than we try? Well, there's no secret in this answer. God tells us in chapter 14, verse 4, he says, but I will gain glory for myself. It's something that he repeats throughout that, that 14th chapter. I will gain glory for myself. I will gain glory over Pharaoh. I will gain glory over the Egyptians. He says, I will gain glory for myself. Could you imagine how differently we would understand this story or, or how we would see it differently if instead of God giving the command to Moses, what if Moses was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got an idea. I'm just going to put my staff over the water. If that were the case, who would we assign the glory to? We would be sitting here thinking, wow, how great is Moses? Why doesn't God let us solve some of our own problems? Because he doesn't want to give us any kind of room to confuse a simple truth that God is God and we are not. He doesn't want to give us any space to confuse that in any way. And in doing so, he's sending us a message that we need to stop trying and start trusting. Now, preparing for tonight and preparing for this topic, there was a piece of encouragement that was given to me a handful of years ago and it just continues to be something that, that comes up time and time again in my life. Whenever I feel like I'm dealing with disappointment or whenever I feel like maybe God is sending me toward a dead end or sending me into a corner. When uh, my wife and I moved to Indianapolis, we wanted to really take our time with our home search. We were kind of tempted. We were like, okay, we're living all the way, you know, miles and miles and miles away, but we really want a house. So like, do we, do we find somebody at the church that we really trust and let them go tell us if this is a good house or not? And that way we just get to move straight into the house. Do we, do we live somewhere else? Or what's the plan? So we decided that we were going to get an apartment when we got here. And so we did that. We got an apartment, um, and it was great. Then we made a horrible, horrible mistake. We decided that we were going to go to the animal shelter just to look at puppies. Impossible. Nobody can go to the animal shelter and just look at puppies. But we were told ourselves that we were strong enough just, just to look. Um, one thing led to another, and a week goes by, and guess what? We've got a puppy. Um, and so we take that puppy back to our apartment, and we very quickly realize apartments aren't great for puppies, um, and we needed a little bit more space. And so we were able to begin working with our realtors, Jim and Kristen, who I know many of you, you know, um, and they showed us probably a dozen houses, um, and just none of them seemed quite right. We looked at a dozen, none of them were quite, quite, uh, quite right. Eventually, we find this house. We're looking online, we find it in the morning, and it's beautiful. It's perfect. It's the exact uh, size house that we want. It's got all of the rooms. Um, it's in a, a great location. Um, it's got a whole bunch of updates. Um, we find it in the morning. We make plans to go and see that house in the afternoon. By the time we go and see that house in the afternoon, mentally, we've already moved in. It's already our house. We've already decided, you know, where the furniture is going to go, you know, who's going to be in this room, where's the crib going to go. We see the puppy playing out in the yard. 
all of those things. We'd already moved in. The only problem was between morning and afternoon, that house sold, right? And the disappointment was just overwhelming. And of course, we, we just got way ahead of ourselves in this process, but we were so disappointed. And it was at that point that uh, Kristen shared some encouragement with us. She said something along the lines of, this just means that God hasn't finished preparing his place for you somewhere else yet. In other words, hey guys, it's time to stop trying and start trusting. So tonight, if you are feeling hopeless, if you are feeling trapped, if you're feeling like you've been sent into a dark corner or a dead end, then consider that it's likely time to stop trying and start trusting. And as Moses puts it in verse 14, he says, the Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Your battle is his battle. Knowing that, you can stop trying and you can start trusting. So I invite you to go with me to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time to come together to be encouraged by your word. Lord, you know how badly we want to be a part of finding our own solutions. But Lord, we pray that in all circumstances that we would be able to trust, trust that you have a plan, that you are working for our good. Lord, we pray that Above all things, we would be able to, to put our hope in you and put our trust in you. I pray all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen.